Uh, my name is Brad Nickerson. I'm president of the GEMSEG Grand Lake Watershed Association. And our watershed covers about 3,950 square kilometers, which is uh, about 70% of the size of Prince Edward Island. It's a fairly large watershed for into a smaller group such as ours to, uh, to work on and uh, work with and kind of develop more positive, uh, healthy watershed interaction education programs such as this webinar. And Grand Lake, the 171 square kilometers is the largest freshwater lake in the Maritimes. And if you're not already a member of our association, we encourage you to join us. Memberships cost $10 per year and they support our activities, including the organization and hosting of this webinar. To join us, you can just visit our website and click the blue join us button on the upper right corner. We welcome your questions. As I mentioned already, use the chat window to ask any questions as they arise. We may not be able to answer them immediately, but we will get back to them. And please, please stay till the end of the presentation. Uh, Eric has planned quite an interesting interactive session with questions and answers that you type directly into the chat window. So we're hoping that this will be kind of a a good interaction and, and, and Eric, Eric has five questions that he would very much like your responses to kind of to help formulate our way forward in our water quality and ecosystem monitoring activities. Eric Luper is an aquatic ecologist and fish biologist. He grew up in Toronto and spent summers at a cottage in Kawarthas, Ontario. Eric obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in uh, marine biology and a master of science degree in zoology, both from the University of Guelph. He was an environmental consultant in British Columbia, Newfoundland and New Brunswick before joining Environment Canada in 2003. I guess it's called um, Environment and Climate Change Canada now. Eric has worked on lakes and rivers in eight provinces, including Labrador and in the high Arctic in Nunavut. He and his family became Grand Lake cottage owners in 2020 in the Cumberland Bay area. And Eric has kindly led our association's volunteer water quality observation program during the 2020 and 2021 field seasons. Eric's going to tell us something about the two years of water quality data gathering that we've done at this analysis. So Eric, it's over to you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share your screen. Uh, I think you're still muted, Eric, or I can't hear yeah, you. That'd be kind of a showstopper if your <laughs> presenter is on uh, mute the whole session. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming. And that was a very nice introduction, Brad. Um, uh, consider this an informal session. If you have a question, throw it out in the chat. If you have something to say, no problem. I, I prefer some discussion as opposed to me just rambling through and uh, people dozing off. So if you have something of interest or something to raise, by all means, bring it up. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned that, I'll start the presentation. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Does that look good, Brad? That is very good. Thank you. Okay. So um, we've done this water quality monitoring program now for two years. And why I came up with the title that we did is that uh, people are already starting to ask me, geez, what, what, what's the change we saw from one year to the next? And, and where do we go from here? So I thought I'd kind of give a little bit of background of what we know after two years and then discuss what we don't know and maybe kind of a, a game plan to proceed in the future to maybe address some of those questions. Okay, so what do we know? We know water quality chemistry after two years, 2020 and 21. What we don't know, we're going to talk a little bit later on about some trends and also about ecosystem health. Neither one of those have we been able to address really with our two years of water quality monitoring. So what do we know? So last year, um, we set upon a, a water quality monitoring program uh, within uh, Grand Lake, the GEMSA Grand Lake watershed. 
and we recognize pretty quickly it's a big lake and for us to not tap out our volunteers too much we thought it'd be a really good idea to break our group into two two teams a team south and the team north and we kind of respectively do the the stations on one of the lake and the other team does the ones on the other side so we started off uh monitoring basically the uh lake alliance association kind of program we're looking at uh doing uh, measurements using what we call a YSI or a multimeter. And those collect uh, parameters of temperature, oxygen, pH, and conductivity. And I've just recently heard that they have a new probe that can measure cyanobacteria or it's micro microtoxins. I'm not too familiar yet with that, but that sounds kind of interesting. And we can maybe see if that's something that we can look at in the future. Uh, we also, measured water clarity using a Secchi disc. For those that don't know what a Secchi disc is, I'm not sure if Mike Kelly is on, on the line here or not, but that's him supporting the Secchi disc over the side of the boat on the right side of the slide. And it's uh, basically a crosshair of uh, white and dark patches. And you see how far down into the water column you can lower that before it disappears. And then you uh, note that depth and that gives you a, a relative estimate of the water clarity. We also collected a lot of uh, nutrients, major ions, uh, that's pure water chemistry. So we collect water samples from the surface for those. Um, those are analyzed at our local lab here in Fredericton, the Research Productivity Council. On the right, you'll see the suite of the different analysis that are, are being done there. As well, we collect E. coli, um, which is an indicator of fecal bacteria. And um, uh, later on in the presentation, I'll show you what our, our plan was there. As also part of the water chemistry suite, we collect trace metals. Again, you can see the long list of things that we collect on the right side of, uh, of the slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of that detail. Um, uh, that a lot of those numbers show up in our report, which uh, Brad is going to put on onto the website. And there's a little bit more detail there. And we actually included the original raw results. So if anyone wants to go in there and see what we actually what we actually got. Um, so uh, in addition, this year we added uh, deep water sampling with the uh, support of the Lake Alliance. We were able to purchase a Niskan sampler. And that's uh, Mike Kelly and myself using that there in the picture. And so what that allows you to do is drop that cylinder, the top and the bottom kind of fold over to the side. So the cylinder is open to the water column as you drop it down. And then you can activate it with a messenger from the surface to close it. And it encapsulates the, uh, the water at the depth that you're wanting to capture. So in our case, we're uh, looking at two deep water sites in our lake and the samples were collected at about 20 meters. And you can then use that water for sample analysis or for whatever you need. Um, <clears throat> on our lake uh, in last year, you could see the black spots. Those are our, our permanent or not a permanent, but our second year uh, lake sampling sites. Um, as you can see, uh, let's see if my arrow here, JB, GGLPO3. Um, you can see down here, we've indicated the depth of each of those sites there. So this is about 26 meters here. And this one here is about 24. The others are much, are much uh, shallower. Uh, as well, we noticed from our results last year, uh, from those sites that are near rivers, this, this one here near a Salmon River, this one here, Newcastle Creek, and down here by Maquapit, um, that we were getting some water chemistry results. So we thought it would be good to also find out what's coming in from the river. So we added these three river sites up here on the Salmon River, this one here on Newcastle Creek, and this one here is at Lakeville Corner between uh, French Lake and Maquapit Lake. Um, <clears throat> kind of starting with our results for, uh, for our water quality work here. Um, I'm going to show a vertical profile at Cumberland Point. So that's one of our, our deep sites. 
And for those that aren't familiar with vertical profiles, if you see here, we have depth. Think of this being the surface of the lake and this going down into the deep part of the lake. And then with the YSI that we were measuring temperature and oxygen with, <clears throat> we plotted the data for two months. Blue is in June and orange is in August to show you what happens uh, with those parameters when you go deep into uh, the deeper part of the lake. So in June, last June, we had a warmer than normal month. And what you can see here is that the temperature, which is characteristic of lakes, is it was consistent till about uh, 15 meters and then there was a sharp decline in temperature. So the thermocline was being established here, meaning that this body of water was not mixing very much with this body of water. So what happens over time, when you have this type of thermocline set up, you start to see your oxygen level decrease as you're not getting oxygen from the surface anymore. So if you now look at the orange lines for August for temperature and dissolved oxygen, over here dissolved oxygen, you can see what happens through the summer months is now you're starting to see this oxygen level come below this red dash line here, which is the uh, CCME guideline, which is basically the national uh, oxygen criteria level for, uh, for uh, lakes. So that's 5.5 milligrams per liter. So you can see in this deep part of the lake, you're starting to get oxygen values that are, are below that criteria. So usually what you'll end up happening is fish and other aquatic life will move out of those areas and look for for uh, more oxygen. Um, as mentioned before, we have a whole suite of uh, different uh, water chemistry parameters, but I've only kind of brought up three here just to give you a sense of what's going on. And these three are ones that um, showed some minor, minor concern. Um, so what we have here is uh, average aluminum concentrations. On the side here, we have the actual concentration milligrams per liter, and then the actual sites at the bottom. So if you can think of the striped sites as being river sites, and the solid sites being the actual lake sites. And we've paired these to be with the sites that are close to each other. So this Salmon River is closest to this Northeast Arm site. Same thing with the Newcastle Creek and Newcastle Bay. Lakeville Corner and McQuapit, and these three here aren't associated with the uh, any individual rivers. These are the main open lake sites, and this is the actual Gemstick River itself. So you can see for aluminum, in these three cases, the highest levels are from the river site coming in, and then there's a little bit of a residual effect in the lake station close by to that. And you can see that happen consistently through these three sites. In the open lake and the gem seg, you can see that those inputs from the river are attenuated and they become much, much less. And you can see here, they're, they're, uh, they're much lower and very consistent. We found through all the parameters that the gem seg river water chemistry is very much similar to what's in the middle of the lake, which you would expect as it's the main drainage point for the lake. Uh, for total nitrogen, uh, nutrients are a concern for us in Grand Lake. So uh, I've included uh, average total nitrogen here. Again, the same setup of, of the bars with river being the striped bars, and then lake sites being the solid bars, and then the same configuration here. You can kind of see a similar trend happening where the river and the associated lake sites are a little bit higher than what we have down here. The green line is um, a criteria that we developed for the St. John River and it's kind of an acceptable level. And this is a level that above which you start to have some concern. In between is okay. It'd be nicer if it was below the green, but still at an okay level. And then here we talk show phosphorus. Again, the same layout for the bars. Um, you could see here that at Salmon River and at Lakeville Corner, similar to last year, we're getting some signs of phosphorus being above what we consider kind of a, a criteria level. And that's why we're investigating a little bit more, trying to see 
um, where that phosphorus is coming from. Is it a concern? Is it naturally in the system or is it coming from somewhere? So something that we'll continue to investigate and try to figure out what's going on. As mentioned earlier on, we uh, wanted to see what's going on at our for water chemistry at the deep sites. As you, as you saw earlier on, I showed you the thermocline that gets established in the lake. Um, not only does oxygen chain, other different parameters can change there as well and not actually have a, a physical water sample from there. We couldn't really determine what was going on. So using the Niskin sample, we were able to collect uh, samples from, from 20 meters. And we did that for both July and August. And what was interesting is that at both sites we're seeing a similar pattern. And what we saw was a reduction of pH, an increase in zinc, and as mentioned before, a decrease in oxygen, and then an increase in nitrate and turbidity. Except for the oxygen, uh, where the, it was going below the criteria, none of these changes were huge changes, but they were consistent and something I'd like to look into next year to see what's going on with the chemistry. Is that something that is explainable or is there something else going on there that we should know about? Um, but it's just interesting that in both basins that we had the same parameter showing up, showing some consistency to the, to the deep water, um, water chemistry. Uh, for those who have been involved with uh, water associations or have done water quality work in the past, you might know, might be familiar with the water quality index. What that is, is uh, an index that compiles many different um, water chemistry parameters together to kind of give you a one-off reading on whether the um, water quality is considered uh, excellent, good, fair, marginal, or poor. Um, and they take into account three different um, components. Um, number one is scope. It's the number of variables not meeting objectives. So for all of the parameters that we looked at, there's a criteria either established by what they call the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, and they've established certain guidelines for different parameters. Um, so if you're an exceedance of that, um, this index will pick that up. Uh, frequency, how many times uh, those objectives are not met with the, with the variables. And also it takes into account how big the exceedance is. Uh, therefore, that gets a bigger rating than one that would be just slightly above the criteria. Eric, could I interrupt you just for a second? We have a question from Alan to everyone. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, for your acceptable levels for things like nitrogen and phosphorus, where do these values come from? Is it something so for, that is applicable to all lakes or is it something you determined? Uh, that's a very good question and I should have maybe extrapolated upon that a little bit. In my previous work on the St. John River watershed, we established parameters for uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, that is something that should be determined kind of for the specific watershed that you're looking at because different parts of the country have different natural backgrounds of nutrients. So what we used was the US EPA method of, uh, of establishing kind of reference conditions and then we, we kind of went from there. Uh, if you'd like a little bit more background on how we got that, uh, send me a note afterwards and I can kind of show you where we got that information and kind of lead you to the literature and US EPA that uh, actually you can use to work that out. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, he says, great, thanks. Uh, CCME has different parameters. Um, I think they do have one for nitrate itself. I personally like using total nitrogen and total phosphorus because I find it gives you a better overall picture of of the nutrient scenario as opposed to using just let's say nitrate or or another component of the nutrients so so for uh, our grand lake samples these are the different parameters that we used and we used the similar ones to those that were used uh, by the province for some of their different watersheds and here I noted, uh, we really only had two that I think that were exceedances other criteria, which were in iron and then for phosphorus. So our 
overall average of the six sites was 91, uh, which is good. Uh, it went up from last year primarily because one site had just a, uh, a, a few fewer exceedances, I believe, for phosphorus. So what we've done here is we've put that information into uh, Grand Lake map. On the right, you can see the different criteria. And uh, to just quickly summarize, a high number is good. So think of it as a report card or a percentage. The higher up you go, the better. So you could see the rankings for each of the different stations we have in the color coded here on the actual lake. So most of them were various versions of green. This one up here towards Salmon River uh, was a little bit lower, kind of orangey yellowish color. And down here we have the actual score and in relation to how we did compare to last year. So an up arrow indicates the score went up. These ones were all very high at 100%. These ones went slightly down. Now I'm going to uh, take you to a different index. And uh, Brad told me to make sure that I emphasize this. So for a trophic index, a low number is good. So think about uh, you don't want a lot of nutrients in your, in your water quality or in your water system. So a lower number means, uh, a, a, I guess, a cleaner, less uh, nutrient-rich system. So uh, for our trophic state, we took into account phosphorus. Uh, uh, Eric, we have another question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's, oh, no, that's perfect. it's very pertinent to what you just said in the slide before. Uh, okay. Janie asks, how did you choose the parameters to use in determining the W, the water quality index? Yes, yeah, so I, oh, where are we here? Let's see if I can. Uh, those ones there were ones that we used because they were uh, standard ones used by the province when they were assessing their uh, different watersheds. However, you can choose these to fit whatever you'd like. Um, I would recommend if you're doing it for your own, like try to pick up parameters that are of concern or you're not trying to hide uh, 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 anything. So you wanna bring out those parameters that you think you might have issues with or ones that in the region might be pertinent. So maybe if you're in an area where um, ore bodies of whatever might be close to the surface, you may wanna have those in your trace metals relevant to that. If oxygen is con concerned, which it normally is, you'd wanna have that and that's flexible. Um, the key thing I'd say with the water quality uh, indicator though, is that don't just use that number as a tell-all for everything because you have many parameters in there. You can have 10 really good ones and one that's not doing very well or one that's a real concern and it sometimes can get buffered in there. So always make sure that you kind of back up your water quality index, making sure that you kind of know what the other um, what the other parameters are. But it is a good single number indicator. Hopefully, I answered that. Maybe. We have another great thanks from uh, Janie. So thank you, Eric. Okay. Uh, so moving to the trophic state, so again, um, you're looking at phosphorus, chlorophyll A, and secchi disc reading, and basically, you can almost think of it as, as your backyard garden. If there's a lot of nutrients in there, you're going to get a, a high number, and you're going to get a lot of things growing, and that's why you can get into categories like down here where uh, you have a lot of algal bloom, algal bloom issues, low, low oxygen, um, if your water is low in fertilizer or nutrients, then um, it's going to be quite clear. You have clear water, um, but also not as productive. So not necessarily bad, just, just different. So this index was put together by Carlson, 1977. There's different versions of it if you're wanting to create your own uh, trophic state. One of the things that we had to do a little bit of adapting for for our trophic state index is that our lake is not very clear. It's got, um, I shouldn't say clear, it's got some color to it. So your uh, Secchi disc readings attenuate fairly quickly and it kind of messes up your, 
trophic state index a little bit. So we tried to do it with and without the uh, Secchi disk reading and kind of came up with a compromise to uh, really show the actual scenario. So for here, um, same thing as we had before, we have a, a lake with our, our Grand Lake sampling stations. And remember, low number is good. So oligotrophic site is uh, here for just off of Cumberland Point. Uh, also down here at Gemseg. The others were just below that at mesotrophic. So that's kind of an intermediate level of productivity. And for the size of our lake, we're kind of in where I thought we would be for be between oligotrophic and mesotrophic. But we are keeping an eye on those nutrient levels that uh, coming in from the inputs um, from the inflow to the lake, just to see what's going on and and uh, trying to see if we can find ways of, uh, of detecting exactly where the source is from and hopefully at some point down the road trying to reduce those. Um, this year we greatly uh, upscaled our E. coli sampling program. For those that don't know, E. coli is a, uh, is a sign of fecal contamination and um, is used by most, uh, most uh, health departments across Canada to determine whether there's concern, usually in beach areas or areas of, uh, of human activity, let's say cottage areas, or areas of beaches and so forth. So this year we uh, sampled 14 areas around the Gemsa Grand Lake watershed area, uh, determined if there was any issues. Um, the sites were sampled once in late August and all the CCME, uh, sorry, all the samples were below the CCME guidelines of 400 uh, units per 100 mil. Um, the highest site we had was 140. That's still way below the 400 but it's, um, it's still kind of higher than the other sites. And just to be clear, the CCME guideline is for recreational activities. So this is not for drinking water. Well, drinking water, E. coli, I think the province ex expects you to have almost nothing in it, a zero count. Uh, but this is for recreational activity in the lake itself. So two different guidelines. So what we have here is uh, a map uh, showing our different E. coli sampling locations. And on the left, you could see the actual name of the actual location that we uh, sampled at. The size of the circle and the color of the circle indicate the actual E. coli level. So down here in the right legend, you could see the different categories. Uh, most of our sites were green and many of them were in the small green, indicating that uh, the E. coli level is quite low. Um, and then this is the one site here at Douglas Harbor that's a little bit higher. So we're hoping to explore that a little bit more next year to see if it's, if it's a concern at all, maybe expand our sampling in different months and maybe also sample at different spots within the harbor to see if, if there is a pinpoint source for that or if it's just an accumulation within the enclosed bay. Okay, I've provided you a little bit of a summary of our uh, water quality results. Um, just to let you know, and I've attached the website at the end here, um, we've put together a actual water quality report that gets submitted to the New Brunswick Envi Environmental Trust Fund. And I encourage you, if you're interested in more of the details, as I mentioned before, all the raw data is in there, the actual results from RPC, and then our summary, a lot of the information that uh, I just talked about was in there, but there's also some more, basically some more numbers and some more calculations if, if that's of interest to you. So now we'll kind of move to the second phase of this talk and that's uh, what we don't know. And as I mentioned, a couple of people asked me, well, what can we, what can we say after two years of uh, water quality sampling, what has changed? And uh, I thought, okay, we should maybe clarify this to people, maybe get a, people to understand and why it's important to do some, some of the things that we are, we're suggesting doing. So my first question was, can you detect change in trends after two years? And the answer is uh, no. <laughs> There's too much year-to-year -year variability 
different parameters have different variability and require a longer period of time for detecting uh, changes or trends. Some you can get away with a uh, little bit shorter time. So I'm just gonna bring up a little bit of an example here. Hopefully this, this makes sense to people. This is water quality uh, data collected from several lakes in Muskoka, which is located in Ontario. You can see here on the right is the temperature taken at the surface of uh, the lake in August. And here at the bottom is years going from 1982 to 2013. So what I'm showing here is uh, four points between about 2006 and 2009. And my uh, question Eric, is, Eric, uh, sorry to interrupt. But I, oh, yeah, you've got four years there. Yes, I see. My apologies. Yeah. And so um, the question is from here, can you tell, are the, is the trend going up, down, staying the same? You know, what would you estimate from those four years? So the temperature is mostly between 22 and 23 there. Maybe you anticipate it to kind of stay between that range as we go along. So let's see what actually happens. So there's the actual analysis for that temperature data. So if you're just looking at these points here, obviously the variability in temperature over time for this system is such that you would not be able to detect the trend from just these four points with the large scale changes that happen in some years and um, up some years up, some years down. So really important, and that's why I've been emphasizing for a program that for especially temperature that we pick a spot, it doesn't have to be very complicated. We're gonna keep it as simple as possible. We're somewhere where we can get a full year temperature data and being able to do it year after year. Um, I think that's really important. Getting summer, Summer data is good as well, but I think if we can collect full year data, that would be um, quite useful. A lot of these loggers now are quite small. We use these hobo loggers are about the size of a very thick uh, quarter and they can log for you know a couple of years. And I have one right now set up off of my buoy and hopefully it'll still be there in the spring and that the ice can carry it away. Um, but I, I recommend for those that are on other lake associations to try to do that. They're not very expensive. The loggers are about $100 each. If you can find a good spot to um, keep them in, that would be, uh, I think, useful data to have. Um, other things that you might consider, and I guess it depends on your, uh, on your uh, watershed, be a lake or river, or the concerns that you have. But these are other parameters I think wouldn't be bad to have. Uh, long-term trends for. Uh, another one that would be useful for us on Grand Lake and from what I understand the Oromukto Lake people have been doing very well for a long time is that indicating things like uh, ice in and ice out of the lake. Um, doing that over the long term has been very useful in determining kind of climatic changes and um, when the ice goes out things start to happen in the lake that change change um, the activities are quite quickly from algae and primary production and zooplankton development and that. So it's um, something to keep in mind. The other thing that we don't know is the state of the ecosystem. For a long period of time in the biological world, we thought, well, if we get water chemistry data, that will tell us if you know the system is healthy or not. We know that is that is not the case, that if we really want to get a sense of the state of the ecosystem, we need to do more than just measure the, the chemistry of the system. Uh, the reason being that we may not be measuring the source of the potential effect. There are many things that go on in an ecosystem that could affect, let's say, the population of a fish or birds or trees or whatever it might be. It could be disease, invasive species, uh, weather, food supply, habitat loss. Um, so just taking the water chemistry doesn't necessarily give you a sense of what's going on in the ecosystem. So how do we evaluate the ecosystem? There's lots of different ways of doing it. I'm gonna kind of explain what is currently the, kind of the way that monitoring programs are set up. 
And that is initially you kind of determine your, your baseline conditions of key components of your aquatic ecosystem. I'll go into details of these a little bit later. Then from that, you want to select indicators of the ecosystem, things that are important to the ecosystem, things that might be sensitive, things that you might want to protect. And then you want to kind of run a monitoring program of your indicators selected. And then at the end, you want to have a feedback loop. So after you get your monitoring program results, you want to be able to say, OK, is the monitoring program working? Are we protecting what we want to protect? What needs to change? So starting with baseline studies, um, these in conclude, it could include uh, many different things, but what you want to know is what is the current status of the thing that you're looking at? Um, one of the important ones is uh, shoreline or littoral zone habitat. You can look at how much is being developed, how much is being preserved, is there invasive species there? Uh, what type of habitat is it? Uh, what types of critters can live there? You can also look at primary producers uh, for your baseline study. So primary producers are algae, uh, phytoplankton, cyanobacteria. They can also be macrophytes, which are rooted plants. Um, just so that those that aren't familiar with the term primary producers, primary producers basically means those that are using photosynthesis to create energy. So they're basically the ones that are, are, are creating uh, creating themselves from, from the sun. And then the primary consumers are those that eat the primary producers. So those would be zooplankton, which are tiny organisms that live in, in the lake uh, water column itself, or uh, benthic macrovertebrates, those who have ever played around the shoreline of a lake and lifted up rocks. And you see the tiny critters crawling underneath those. Usually they're larval insects. Uh, um, those are what you call benthic macrovertebrates. It's kind of a long, fancy name for just the critters that you find on the bottom of the lake. Or it could be something like fish or other things uh, in areas where there's lots of reptiles and uh, amphibians. They could be part of your baseline study, as this cute little snapping turtle is here on, uh, on our Grand Lake system. So I'm just going to give a couple of... Uh, examples of uh, baseline studies and how you would go about it. Um, something like a lake shoreline habitat. We have quite an extensive shoreline for uh, Grand Lake. Um, it would take a little bit of time and effort, but I think we have a good volunteer base. We could, we could make some headway on that. This is just an example of another, another lake where they've actually gone along the shoreline and identified different types of vegetation along the shore and as well as um, added the bathymetry. Uh, we have bathymetry for our lake. I think some of it could be up, updated, but the, uh, because we've been an area that the uh, DFO and Coast Guard have uh, graphed, we have some pretty good charts for that. You can also look at the shoreline substrate. Is it sandy? Is it cobble, boulder? Is it cliff face? So all those types of things you can kind of create your shoreline habitat map. We're talking earlier on about uh, primary producers or uh, algae. Uh, in most lakes, uh, the most important type of plant life are algae and cyanobacteria. Uh, we've had uh, cyanobacteria <clears throat> issues in the province the last few years, so something that is of, of concern, primarily on the main channel of the St. John River. We haven't um, we haven't seen huge effects on Grand Lake, but something we're keeping an eye on. Uh, also, you can get blooms of other types of algae. So phytoplankton harness the energy for the sun and nutrients for the water and make up, make up a good food source for critters in the lake itself. Um, as part of our kind of start to thinking about looking at uh, monitoring ecosystems. We did collect a uh, phytoplankton sample this year. Um, we collected it in the fall and um, the community that we got out of that represented kind of what you would call a, a fall or seasonal affected um, uh, community. Uh, the phytoplankton was dominated by diatoms. You can see your little graph here, pie chart. 
uh, percentage of the different types of algae that were there. Um, some algae, was, some green algae was found and small amounts of gold algae was there as well. And overall, the community reflects the intermediate uh, nutrient richness found in Grand Lake, which kind of goes in, uh, in step with what we found for the water quality, kind of a mesotrophic, oligotrophic system. And I thank uh, Cal Gilstrom who helped us with the reporting on this and has quite a bit of uh, experience with uh, plankton, so it helped with some of our analysis. So on here, I've included a graph, a uh, series of graphs that we had last year in, in our uh, seminar from last year. You see here this dotted line, dashed line is located about 30 degrees C. At the very top, you can see there's a uh, cyanobacteria with its growth rate being maximum right around that 30 degree level. And these different types of uh, algae, so this would be the green algae, it's less than 30. And as you go down, the dinoflagellates lower and the diatoms even lower. So our sample was probably taken when the temperature was around 15 degrees. And therefore, we saw a lot of diatoms. Meanwhile, we didn't see any cyanobacteria, but we collected late in the season. So you can see they like to have a much warmer temperature. So for next year, we'd like to expand our phytoplankton sampling to include an early season, a mid season that captures that hot, warm August water, and then one later on in, in uh, September or October. So hopefully we can get a better analysis of the overall community in, in the lake. Um, zooplankton. So these are things that eat the phytoplankton. We've got a couple of pictures here at the bottom. Daphne on the right are quite common and copepods. Those are both fairly common uh, critters. They're microscopic, so you don't see these things as big entities in your, while you're swimming in the water. They're quite small, um, but they do feed on phytoplankton and they're a food source for many species of fish. And depending on the blooms of zooplankton you have, they can be quite effective at uh, filtering out uh, phytoplankton. Uh, as well as the phytoplankton sample that we took last year, we also took a zooplankton using uh, a sample using a plankton net. And the sample was dominated by small herbivorous species, meaning that the species that we were catching were primarily eating algae, not other, not other critters. And they were species that were ca catching were indicative of cold water or cold condition lakes. Again, the species that were catching indicated legotrophic or mesotrophic conditions, which went along with our phytoplankton and our water quality uh, results. And the relative sm small size of the observed species indicate that there's a community of plankton eating fish in the lake, which would be expected. If you go and sample zooplankton from a lake that has no fish, you get some pretty neat looking zooplankton and some pretty big ones that you can actually see with your eye because they're not being, not being eaten by the fish community. So I've given you kind of an example of a few different types of uh, components of the ecosystem that you can look at in terms of getting baseline information. After you've looked at all your different types of uh, communities that are interested or components of the ecosystem that are interest to you. From there, you need to uh, pick indicators. So indicators are defined as a measure that, sorry, I have my bar in, that characterize an ecosystem or one of its critical components. Um, so something that say um, in a system that say there's a species of fish that's very prized, or there might be um, some type of uh, algae that's causing a problem or something, you may wanna have that as your indicator because it's indicating a, uh, a key component for the ecosystem health. And it's important for when you pick your indicators to also take into uh, account the human element there because there are, in our case, we have lots of cottages around the lake. So a certain fish species might be important for people eating it or um, uh, something else might be important for us. So important to include those when you're doing your, 
selection of uh, indicators. So for Grand Lake, um, I've kind of put together a few options that we can have as uh, indicators. Um, we discussed about uh, doing shoreline habitat, uh, collecting that information. Uh, you can use macrophytes. Macrophytes are uh, algae that are, have roots to them. Uh, our lake is a little bit tricky because we have such a big range of, um, of uh, high water and low water that the macrophytes, a lot of them are, are fairly deep. I think we could probably find areas in the lake to do it. Um, but a lot of the areas that get exposed don't, uh, macrophytes don't live well in, in those areas. And the types of things you can look at is uh, the biodiversity of the plants, the percentage cover of a certain type of bottom. You know, you can monitor that over time to see how it changes. Um, we talked about plankton. Again, you can look at biodiversity, the abundance, how many of them are. And there are indices being established, um, diet for diatoms being one of them, um, kind of like the water quality index by looking at the community uh, you can evaluate using this index to see whether um, uh, there's some type of stress or either maybe too much nutrients or maybe too much of a contaminant or maybe not of something um, that can actually give you a little bit of an indication of how the, the health of the uh, aquatic ecosystem is doing. Benthic macroinvertebrates, for those that are fishermen, you'll probably know what that is. The stonefly, so a lot of the larvae um, uh, live under the rocks and within the rock, kind of the cobble rocks in, in the bottom of the lake. Um, the indices developed for these are primarily done for rivers, but they're also used for lakes. Um, and uh, you can do different types of uh, sampling from, you can sample on the shoreline using a, a net sample, or you could uh, do sediment samples using, uh, using different types of grab samplers. Or you could use fish, you could look at the biodiversity, abundance, or contamination. Let's say if uh, a lot of lakes in Ontario, they take tissue samples for mercury analysis. Um, if that's a concern, that's something that you could uh, include into your, as one of your indicators. So uh, once you've chosen your indicators, uh, what do you do from there? So, the indicators kind of form the foundation of your monitoring plan. So for each of the, the indicators that you pick, you want to uh, figure out where do you sample and collect the data? How do you have a good spread of uh, sampling sites to know that you're gonna be able to uh, uh, monitor that indicator? How many sites do you need? Uh, for those who are doing statistical analysis, you wanna be able to show that are you actually getting a, a significant difference from uh, one, one area or for one time period versus the next? Uh, how often do you sample and how many samples? And what is the criteria for measuring change? This is a very important one to do and one that requires a little bit of thought before you start, uh, but you need to take into account the natural variability of the indicator itself and then apply a criteria that gives you a meaningful number to say that over a certain amount of time, um, uh, this uh, indicator changed or did not change. And, and if it did change, is it in a positive or negative direction? So I've been talking a long time here and kind of spewing on. Um, before we get to the questions that I have for you, do you have, any questions for me on anything that I've talked about or um, any questions that might have been triggered by the discussion topic? Yeah, so just feel free to type your question to Eric directly into the chat session. All of the questions and answers. Oh, there's one from John. Uh, he says, we're noticing more weeds growing near the shore than in the past. Is this an indicator of more nutrients in the lake than in the past? Uh, yes, it could be. Um, also, depending on your lake, lakes 
once they're formed, generally start to fill up, and that take, can take thousands of thousands of years. Um, but that's natural progression because things drop out of the lake into the bottom. So a shallow lake to begin with, um, the natural progression will be that you'll start to see more and more um, vegetation along the shoreline, but definitely nutrients uh, is, is a factor there. So that's something that uh, you may want to use as an indicator for your lake to see how much growth and, and um, sometimes that growth can be very, very heavy. There are lakes I know where um, there's so much vegetation growing that they actually have to harvest it for, for people that uh, are doing boating or other recreational activities. It just becomes so thick. So something that uh, you may want to consider. Yes. Uh, so I, I know John actually lives in uh, or is, has a seasonal residence in Robertson Point area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's question. something we can consider for our, our for our monitoring plan. Consider. Um, uh, there are parts of the lake I know would be hard to establish a, a good macrophyte site, but if that's that's working there, or if you're having good growth there, that might be a good spot to do that. Okay, another question from John. John asks, are springs a significant source of water for Grand Lake? Springs. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know either. My general thought would be probably no because we don't have a lot of terrain usually um, higher elevations you kind of have the groundwater kind of flowing down and then finding sources to pop out um, i don't see a lot of that around grand lake but i i don't know the answer it, uh, that's a good thing to find out yeah all right uh it's another unknown uh teresa asks uh, what is the input of agricultural and industry of agriculture and industry on water quality of the watershed? That's a very good question. Um, the first part is quite difficult to answer and that being agricultural inputs because they are what we call a non-point source of uh, effluent. So it can kind of come off from a large area of land uh, and flow into your river system, but there's no one pipe that you can go and actually measure it. Hmm. Um, in North America, agricultural runoff is probably one of the top concerns for a nutrient input. And the reason being just what I said, it's very hard to regulate. So uh, for those that are familiar with Lake, the issues that they've had with Lake Winnipeg, the big issue there is uh, just un unregulated uh, fertilizer running off and other uh, um, animal waste running off into the system and causing issues. It's also an issue in Chesapeake Bay and also the Mississippi River and other areas like that. So it's hard to know. I My gut feeling on Grand Lake is it doesn't seem to be large areas of agriculture, but there are little pockets here and there. Um, I don't know. Uh, on the industrial side, um, there is uh, two, two municipal sewage effluent sources. I think one is in Chipman and one is in Newcastle Creek. Um, That's right. I haven't been able to get the data directly from either of those facilities that might be available as a request from the province, um, but those are likely inputting into the rivers that we saw the increased um, levels of nutrients. So they would be uh, coming in there. The biggest area that I don't know much about is the area around Minto and the old uh, uh, power facility and the mining operations there. I don't know if there's anything still going in there. If anyone has any ideas or has seen any reports in the past, we're very interested in seeing that, but um, I don't know any specific numbers. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from Janice. Uh, relating to agriculture, I think, this question says, French Lake is more shallow than the Grand Lake and has water flowing into it from Portobello Sound or Portobello Creek, as uh, I know it. Can you comment on how these factors might impact the lake? Do you plan to do any monitoring on French Lake and Indian Lake? Uh, very good question. <laughs> Well, we started off at the uh, McQuapit thoroughfare and noticed some phosphorus, uh, increased phosphorus there. And then we went to Lakeville, uh, 
Lakeville corner and noticed uh, the phosphorus there as well. So we're, we're kind of following up the system here. We did have plans to try to sample at Portobello Creek, but we had difficulty in getting there as access for anyone knows that area a little bit better. Maybe you can uh, send us a note how we might be able to get there either by vehicle or or small boat at some point, uh, but that was part of our original plan was try to get up there to see if we could sample. Um, I don't think it'd be very hard for us to get a sample in French Lake. So we're definitely wanting to go one system up. And there's not a lot of gradient there. So I think water seems to flow in different directions, but I would think that some of the agricultural activities on the kind of back end of Majorville might be flowing into some of the that kind of a nest of, a, I guess they're not really rivers, but different connected channels in there. And that, that might be a potential source, but yeah, something we'd like to investigate some more. Yes, okay, good. Uh, regarding the French Lake, yes, that, that one I think would be a, a, an easy one for us to. Yeah. I think we proposed something for French Lake for this 2022 season, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, that would be the plan to yeah. try to get something a little bit further upstream. Yeah. Uh, another question from Janie. How do you determine the type of phytoplankton or quantity from a sample? Uh, very good question. Um, I am definitely not a specialist in that. So when we collected our phytoplankton sample, we sent it out for analysis to this gentleman now, then Halifax, who specializes in that. And the different types of phytoplankton are measured differently. Uh, if you look at the diatoms, diatoms have what they call silica spicules. So they have these little sharp edges to them. And, and you basically uh, put them through a process where you get rid of all the, um, all the uh, tissue on the outside and you're just left with the spicules. And those themselves are characteristic of the species. Um, in terms of abundance, what we would do is if we're actually looking at a, a quantity or an abundance of phytoplankton, what you would have to do is using your phytoplankton net, collect a known amount of water column, and then you collect that up, and then you can actually use a microscope to see how many counts you can get underneath a certain area of a known volume of water. So you can kind of work your way back up and you can then basically work out a density of phytoplankton per volume of water. Okay, very good. A question from Bob. What contributes to the brownish color of the water in Grand Lake? Uh, that's a good question. Um, my uh, feeling is most of the water flow into uh, Grand Lake has got that tanny color and that usually is associated with bog or boggy style water. Um, whether there's other reasons for that as well, I'm not sure. I would also think that the natural color of the rock around the lake is kind of a brownish color. So I would think those two um, items are contributing. If there's others, I'm not sure, but I would think those would be the two main ones. I've noticed that when I'm in the middle of the lake, even when the water is quite clear, it still has that yellow, that yellow tanny color to it. <clears throat> okay, very good. And uh, the question from, I think it's Kathy, is are there any indicators that the itch, as it's so-called, is present in the water, the, the so-called itch, and what causes it? I will. Oh, that's a good question, and I am not a specialist on that, but I think it's a uh, species of uh, oh, my uh, brother-in-law is a uh, health inspector, and he knows this very well, but that is something that I would um, consider as a uh, indicator if that's a concern in your lake and how you would monitor it. I, I assume you'd probably be able to collect samples of water and to actually um, determine if they're there, how to get rid of those, I don't know. I know that there are several lakes in the province that have that, um, but I, I don't know much about them myself. Um, uh, if I you're interested, have... let me know and I can follow up for you and get some more information. On, on our waterfront uh, in Waterboro, I have had that itch before on, the, on my legs. And uh, I think it's related to something about a life cycle of a, 
a small parasite that exists in ducks or, or geese or birds and then migrates uh, through their excrement uh, in a life cycle that's very unique. If you look it up, it's quite a closed cycle and interesting to, I don't think it's yeah. dangerous, but it's very itchy, at least for me and my lower legs when I had it. For those that are interested in parasites, some of them have the most outstanding life cycles and weird, weird habits that they're quite interesting. They're not always the nicest looking things, but they're, they're quite interesting from a life cycle perspective. But yes, I, unfortunately, I don't have any direct answers for you oh, on that. But uh, Mar Mary has the uh, has the scientific name. It's uh, C-E-R-C-A-R-I-A-L, Cercarial Dermatitis, Swimmer's Itch. It's a microscopic parasite. So I guess that's kind of a, a pointer to some further information for Kathy who can follow that up. Right, so we have a question from Kirby. Do you have a citizen science program for local residents and cottagers to participate in? and contribute to your sampling or monitoring efforts? Uh, well, all I can say is hang on to answer these questions, but absolutely, we, uh, we're all volunteer based for, for Grand Lake and uh, we're always looking for help. So uh, hang on to uh, the questions, but absolutely, yes. Okay, and I might mention that we're just starting an invasive plant patrol program that uh, we're looking for people who would like to be interested in that. And uh, there is more information on that on our educational resources site on our website. Uh, another thing I'll mention about that, we have a lot of gray hairs on our volunteer group. Um, and that's not a bad thing, but uh, getting some of the younger, younger crew involved, first of all, they love these types of activities and to get them involved would be good education for them and also a great help for us. So. Uh, uh, we welcome all ages. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Alan. Alan's asking, could you post your contact info in the chat? Uh, Eric, I'm asking, uh, I guess Alan is asking about your contact info. Can I put your email address in the chat? Yes, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I will do that. Not a problem. And uh, that is the end of the questions that I see so far. So I'm going to type this little note. You're going to show question one. And uh, uh, I'm going to type in, please answer question one. So we kind of have a marker where it separates the general questions from the question one answers. So can I proceed? You want to show that slide? That would be great. Okay. So question one, uh, just following up on the discussions we had, are you interested in an ecosystem monitoring plan for the GEMSIG? Grand Lake watershed. So is this something you think is important for us to do and uh, something that we should follow up on? Right. Next? So if everybody could just go to their chat window and type into, so everybody can see it, the, their answer, that would be much appreciated. We have a uh, whole, most people saying yes, which is great. Uh, I don't see any no's or maybes yet. So we've probably got at least two dozen uh, yeses. Oh, there's a one maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, that, was, that was a very positive response on that one, uh, Eric. And uh, where people are still asking, uh, still answering. Uh, so I'm just going to wait just for another, oh, I'll wait for another 40 seconds. We'll give a, another till six minutes past nine, and then we'll change the question. And as if, if we were to go down this road, um, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, places like Ontario, which has a lot of lakes, a lot of uh, lake-based monitoring programs, we would lean on some of the literature that's coming out of there. Um, the key is to be smart with your selection of indicators and make sure that you set up the, uh, the initial design of the program well. Take your time with it because in the end, after five years, you want to be able to say, did we are we able to answer what we wanted to, to be able to answer? Okay, I just posted the next marker for please answer question two. So if you can show that slide. Okay, um, we went through a bunch of different types of indicators, uh, but every person has their own uh, 
areas of interest, why you like being on Grand Lake, uh, why you like the, the cottage environment, or if that's your home, uh, what are the things you uh, like about it, or what are the things you're concerned about? So my question too is what indicators would be important for you and type in all that applies. So I've put in here seven different ones. Um, if you have something that is different, please put it in at the bottom as an other, because uh, like uh, the swimmer's itch itself, that could be something important that uh, I may not have think, thought about, but it could be very important for others in the cottage community in the area. So please, uh, uh, indicate which indicators would be important for you, and um, and we'll uh, survey that up. Okay, it's taking <clears> a little <throat> longer for these to come in because multiple uh, multiple answers there. So we'll just hang on for a few minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to post your email address in the chat session so that everybody has access to that. <clears throat> Okay, they're still coming in. There's a lot of variability. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat session, Eric, but uh, uh, quite a few A's and B's. And, well, we we'll have to run some statistics. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, That's very useful information. We may not be able to uh, yeah. to get that uh, information out quickly, but uh, I think it's very useful. I see. A seems to be very consistent throughout there, so. Yeah, and uh, I see there's some very specific comments of Douglas Harbor to identify the sources of uh, E. coli, so that's a, a good one. And Swimmer's Itch comes in, yeah. And uh, I'll just wait till we, we settle this, this response sequence down a bit, and then I'll type the Eric's email address in. I have a question for John Kipping. Yes. He had as a response, a general health indicator. I was wondering, are you talking about uh, human health or ecosystem health? Or I wonder if you could be a little more specific with that one. Lake, Lake health. Okay. Well, I guess what we're doing here with the indicators is, um, that's a very good point. Generally, you don't wanna to have too many indicators but it's almost impossible just to have one to give you an overall lake health. So um, it would probably be a, a combination of, uh, you don't like to have too many, but I would say for a lake like ours, you might maybe have like six different types of indicators. The <clears throat> water quality indicator being one of them, I would assume. Is yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that gives you kind of the, the foundation. I didn't include that here because we had quite a bit of it in the actual water monitoring itself but okay. as an ecosystem component. I don't see too many more responses coming in. So I'm gonna just post your, your uh, email address. Okay. And everybody that is interested can pick that off the chat window. And we will, okay, proceed. I'm gonna type in my marker for question three. This is where the gray hair, gray hair members of the uh, Grand Lake uh, community will, uh, <laughs> will be much appreciated. So question three, have you noticed changes in the amount of phytoplankton, which is the algae and uh, cyanobacteria along the shoreline or in the water column over the last 10 to 20 years? Is it the same A, B, less algae, B, see more algae or D haven't been around long enough to notice a trend. Yeah, we've got two C's so far and uh, three D's, another, another C, an A for the same, Douglas Harbor, number of C's and uh, A. This will be very useful. We'll kind of combine that, and um, it'll be interesting to see if uh, 
if it's regional or if it's uh, if there's mm. kind of a general general trend. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Do you mean to, uh, the question from Kirby? Sorry. Do you mean to ask about plankton or just all plants and algae? Uh, I should have been specific. I'm talking about uh, the algae in the water column, not the rooted algae, but you can make a comment about rooted algae as well. Okay. I was thinking primarily about algal blooms, but I know in the areas of the lake and, and like French Lake and that there is quite a bit of macrophyte growth. So by all means, add that in there. <clears throat> Okay, Kirby, I don't see your response yet, so maybe you could uh, use that as a cue. There we go. Okay. All right. So. Okay, we'll move on to question four. Okay, just uh, there's still a few coming in, but just wait till I post, okay. post the uh, please answer question four marker. We only have three more questions to grow. No, two more to go. All right, there we go. This is a fun one for me because I'm a, a fishing guy. Um, okay. Do you fish in the Gemse Grand Lake watershed? If so, which species and type in all that apply? So A is no, they don't do any fishing and uh, B through G give you various options. Um, there's some I know that I've missed, but I the list was kind of growing long on me. so I. Just put an H for other. Okay, we have uh, we don't have any positive responses. Yes, everybody's typed uh, A so far. Oh, there's a B and a D. Okay. Uh, the general trend that I've seen for statistics um, around Atlantic Canada and also for Canada is that generally there is fewer and fewer people uh, fishing in the net, in the population. There's one, uh, one response with F and G, and then a B and a D. And if anyone puts down E, I'd like to speak with you. <laughs> I'd like to find you're, it. You're looking for I... something for the Barbie, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know they've caught them in the St. John River, the striped bass. So, yeah. OK. There's somebody who's mentioned freshwater clams. C, D, and E. Okay, they're still coming in, Eric. So there is some some fishing, but it's I wouldn't say it's predominant uh, among among the attendees this evening. Someone mentioned about freshwater clams, and that's something that when I do uh, go snorkeling around my shoreline, there are a lot of freshwater clams, and I don't know if they're edible. I haven't tried them myself, but there's, they're definitely abundant in number and, and uh, are good filters. So you like to have them around. Yeah, there's a <clears> lot <throat> in front of our place that uh, in Waterboro as well. Okay, well, I think uh, we're down to one last question here. Okay. And uh, this one is uh, question five. Would you be one to help volunteer with such a program? So someone indicated earlier on about citizen uh, being involved in the citizen program, absolutely. Um, uh, no one in our group gets uh, paid, we're all volunteers. And uh, we do it because we like to do it. And uh, uh, there's always an opportunity for different things. If there's uh, something you want to initiate, I know that last year we had some volunteers start the invasive species program, looking at different type of uh, macrophyte growth in the water. Um, us doing the water quality monitoring, hopefully expanding into um, an ecosystem monitoring program. Yeah. So there's quite a few yeses. That's that's really good to see. Uh, some people with a maybe. Maybe we can uh, entice them somehow to join our team here at the lake. Uh, certain Saturdays. I know we usually try to go out for the water quality monitoring on Saturdays or Sundays or weekend periods. Yeah, maybe if with the COVID restrictions, hopefully easing up a little bit, maybe in later in the late spring or something, we could have a barbecue somewhere with those that are interested and we could show them the different types of things we're doing and see if that would uh, appeal to them or not. Um, definitely, we are interested in people who have boats that don't mind going out on the lake to do some work. 
Uh, I know that we use my boat here and uh, Hayes and Hughes has been very nice and offered his boat on the south end of the lake and we could use a couple more. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, so. All right, so that looks, I don't see too many more responses coming in, but uh, it's valuable to have those responses. Um, we, we'll have to kind of visit the, okay, John, John says, how could sailboats participate? There's a good uh, question. I'll, I'll, I'll come up with something. <laughs> they're out twice a week in the, in the, in the main season in the summer. So, uh, yep, that's, uh, let me put my thinking cap on there very well could be something for that. Yeah, <clears throat> they're in the water and primarily between Douglas Harbor and uh, where is it on the other side? John, you'll have to remind me. It's not, is it White's Cove? I think so. And then back to Scotch Town and then up to Douglas Harbor. So kind of a triangle for the main racing season. That's kind of on the south end of the lake. Okay, well, uh, we've come to the end. Thank you very much for all those that participated and hung on. Uh, geez, how long have we been now? An hour and 20 uh, minutes. Yes, yeah, an hour 15, yeah. That's sorry, sorry about that, people, but hopefully um, you got something out of this, and I definitely got something out of this. Um, as mentioned before, our water quality uh, reports are on our website. No, not um, quite yet. Uh, the, the 2021 reports, I haven't posted them yet, but they're ready to be posted. So the next two days. Okay, yeah. And also they're a source of information about our different projects, updates, and links. And uh, Brad has done a wonderful job of setting that page up. There's lots of great photos. And uh, uh, I think it's a, a, a interesting spot to go. And uh, like I said, we will have our Last year's water quality report is already up there and we'll have the new one up soon. And we have kind of a running web page on the water quality results itself. Yes, and uh, thanks thanks again, Eric, for your excellent presentation, for getting us to think a little bit about the future and what a real water quality monitoring program longer term, how it extends into ecosystem monitoring. It's very valuable. Thank you. Okay, well, if... Uh... If we've covered everyone off, thank you very much. And like I said, uh, touch base with me by email if you have any requests, and I'll try to address them. If not, I'll try to find out someone who does. Very good. good thank night, you, everyone. Everybody. Enjoy your refreshments this evening. Yes. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>